In May 2021, the so-called Conference on the Future of Europe has been launched. A unique platform created in order to make voices of all European citizens heard, uh, for everyone to speak up, to say what kind of Europe we all want to live in and to help shape our future. Already from the scope and the amount of topics that are covered in the structure of the conference, it is obvious that the future ahead is full of challenges to which the EU will also have to respond and deal with. One of the basic questions when thinking about the world of our future is certainly how or more precisely with what structure the European continent will tackle challenges such as climate change, digital transformation or upholding the rule of law. Already from the logic of the conference it is important that everyone have a say in this whole process. That also goes for the case of nationalist conservative groups as represented by certain political parties across the European continent. Some of these parties have published the so-called Joint Declaration on the Future of the European Union at the beginning of July 2021. My name is Daniel Martinek and I am a research associate at IDM. I am here today with three distinguished guests to not only discuss and analyze the declaration itself, but to evaluate the circumstances under which it was announced, maybe its perception in specific countries, as well as the possible consequences of strengthening of nationalistic and conservative forces within the EU. Please allow me to introduce you three young experts. I'm glad on behalf of the whole IDM team that these three are currently undertaking a traineeship at our institute. Firstly, Emily Labrun, graduate student in the master degree in International and European Studies at the University of Paris. Emily, welcome. Hello, thanks. Secondly, Dominic Koch, second year student of the Bachelor International Relations and Organizations at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Good to have you here today, Dominic. Hello, thank you. And finally, Misha Nichiporuk, graduate student in Comparative International Relations Master Degree at the Ca Foscari University of Venice, Italy. Thank you for joining us, Misha. Good morning, thank you. As I already mentioned, on July 2nd, 2021, 16 right-wing political parties coming from the countries of the European Union signed a joint declaration on the future of the European Union, where they, amongst others, outlined the importance and necessity of nation-state system in opposition to today's, let's say, communitarian and jointly organized Europe. The document itself is an answer to the Conference on the Future of Europe. By analyzing the content of the document, we can see that its main aim is not to push the respective countries to leave the Union, but rather to reform it, to rebuild it from inside. Nevertheless, in the document, there is actually no clear strategy or list of measures that those parties would use to achieve these goals. They stress the continuing tendency of the European Union to enlarge the integration within its borders, putting in danger the rights of its citizens, whose heritage is threatened by EU's overwhelming politics of cultural inclusion, moral acceptance and, let's say, more positive perception of the mass immigration and of the cultural exchange. Moreover, according to them, the Union's representatives are trying to build a European superstate that would limit the state's sovereignty and would mean an end to the traditional role of the nation states. According to them also, the people of Europe should enhance their powers in order to return the right to represent their interests only to established nation states. According to the signatory parties, the tentative to give to the EU institutions the potential to become bodies that take precedence uh, over national constitutional institutions should be limited immediately, as they would then use it to overcome the sovereignty of its state members' representatives. 
Now, let's start with those who actually signed the declaration. Uh, what are actually these parties and what they have in common? What are their shared goals? Yeah, okay. So, uh, one of the main characteristics that pops up on my mind is their ideological connection to what they consider traditional values of their respective countries. And normally they all have very conservative and reactionary political program. Then we could talk about their rhetoric. It is filled with populist, provocative and often openly discriminatory messages that want the given country to be threatened by some evil force, such as migrants or religious, political and sexual minorities, from which only this party can protect them. There is also a constant blame of the current uh, government to be inefficient and to not represent the true will of the citizens. Meloni, Salvini and Avascal were constantly blaming the premier and the major parties, for example, of mishandling the pandemic crisis, while being themselves completely contradictory about their opinion on it. Nevertheless, when the former two came to power, they did not change anything. And at that point, the fault became suddenly of the opposition. Thank you, Misha. Maybe now going a little bit more to the area of foreign policy. Uh, Emily, what do those parties' representatives have in common from the standpoint of their relations with foreign countries? Thanks. Uh, all of them seem to wish for an implosion of the EU supranational institution system first and to a return to a more national, divided Europe. The purpose behind is to regain control over the borders and to protect themselves better from threats such as mass migration, cultural extinction and the degradation of traditional values. They blame the EU for having supposedly tried to generate those with too permissive and liberal policies. Thank you, but what is actually their, uh, the relationship of these parties to the European Union? Uh, Michel, would you like to comment on this? Yeah, sure. So, uh, the general vision that the given parties have of the EU is quite well described in the declaration itself, even though there are many different shades in their perception of it. We can indeed say that they are frightened by the EU institution's capacity to put pressure on national state systems whose politics go against the general values of the Union. The oppression of minorities, discrimination, radicalization, hate speech, power, centralization. The fact that these institutions have enough influence to change the political direction of a country scares them, as in their opinion no one can stay over the national representatives. Generally, though, they have a common opinion about the migration policies, quotas and limits on the entry of the third state's migrants, protection of the national borders, priority in social help, to the EU citizens only and conservative protection of the so-called traditional national values, such as the language, the religion, the national holidays, the historical heritage, traditional family perceived as a bond only between men and women. Emily, you wanted to add something, right? Yes, so those right-wing parties see the EU as a political entity of its own, and they claim that the Union is becoming a European superstate that aims to destruct European traditions and carry out a cultural and religious transformation. In the past, Viktor Orban, Marine Le Pen and Polish politicians have compared the EU to the Soviet Union. And this comparison depicts the perception of the EU and how they want to imprint this perception on the population. By comparing Brussels to Moscow, they expose what they call an oppression of the member states by the EU and they signal that they object to any form of centralization and supranationalism. Furthermore, by claiming that competences should shift to member states and specifically mentioning the possibility of the incapacitation of national constitutions, they do believe that there should be no EU law above national ones. In that sense, the Polish Constitutional Court has recently been checking whether the government of Poland could refer to the national constitution instead of the Treaty of Lisbon in case of differences. Going to you, Dominic, what about Poland? In the past, there have been many clashes uh, between the current Polish government and the European Commission, am I right? That's right, yes. Uh, the relationship between the governments of Poland and Hungary on the one side and the European Commission on the other have been very complicated. 
Um, the European Commission for the first time ever triggered the mechanisms of Article 7 against Poland in 2017. And since then there have been many major disagreements regarding different positions about, for example, reforms of the, of the judiciary, public media reforms and LGBT rights. While the EU holds the opinion that the reforms undertaken by the Law and Justice Party are against the values of the EU regarding the rule of law, freedom of the press and the rights of the LGBT community, the, the Polish government uh, says that the European Commission should not intrude into internal affairs. They often say that sentence. Um, the European Commission has also been heavily criticizing the Hungarian government with regards to the latest LGBT laws. Here we can already see what the Law and Justice Party and Fidesz and the other parties that signed the joint declaration expect the EU to be. In the declaration, the signatory parties made it very clear that they want the EU to be an intergovernmental organization. With the sentence, I quote, we believe that consensus should remain the basic means to reach a common position, quote end. This shows that the signatory parties, as Misha said in the beginning, seek to reform the institutional nature of the EU but not to completely abandon the project of a European Union. Rather, they would uh, want to use current EU institutions, mainly the European Council and the Council of the European Union. However, they would want to widen the rule of decision-making by consensus to every issue and not only uh, to the most politically sensitive issues like foreign policy or, or e EU enlargement. Thank you, Dominic. Yeah, speaking about the EU en enlargement, do all the signatory parties have a common position regarding the expansion of the EU? On this topic, they usually have contrasting opinions. For instance, Orban, Salvini and Abascal believe that Serbia should immediately join the EU. On the other hand, Marine Le Pen doesn't consider membership as the right method. In her Manifesto for Europe of Nations, published in April 2019, she declared that any attempt to impose new memberships would put the whole of Europe at risk. However, she is prone to use cooperation. She sees this method as more efficient and achievable. On Turkey, opinions also diverge. Warsaw is positive about a future in the EU for Turkey. Again, Marine Le Pen is against. She doesn't consider Turkey as European anyway, but she would be inclined to a more strategic neighboring through cooperation and agreement. Going from these different positions in the foreign policy of the EU uh, to the membership actually uh, in the EU, uh, when we speak from a general point of view, instead of all this negative perception of all these parties regarding the EU, they are actually not seeking to leave the EU, right? Uh, yes, Daniel. Interestingly, in the recent past, we have seen many changes of strategies. Uh, Salvini and Le Pen recently made it public that they do not want to leave the EU, but simply to reform it completely. Le Pen, who has always been a hardliner about the so-called uh, Frexit and the return to the Franc, changed her strategy at least on paper. Uh, she wants to attract more of the less radical electorate by moving her position towards the centre. The Polish Law and Justice Party also does not promote polexit either for the same reason. A party, a party that supports it to leave the European Union will not get the majority of the population behind them. Uh, leaving the EU seems to be too much of a radical step for most Europeans. And perhaps this thought also spread to the minds of your, uh, leaders of the European right-wing parties. As it is clear from the document itself while all of these parties oppose the, let's say, federalist Europe and want to reduce the power of the European institutions, they are far from agreeing on everything. What, what do not they have in common, actually, uh, apart from what we already mentioned? Well, their understanding of and relation to Russia differed significantly. While Viktor Orban and Marine Le Pen are pretty much pro-Russia and maintain good relations with the Kremlin, Polish conservatives see the Russian president as, as a threat and has reaffirmed its ties to the West and, and the US especially. Salvini also maintains friendly relations uh, with Moscow. 
He has traveled regularly to Russia and repeatedly expressed his wish to see economic sanctions lifted. On the other hand, the president of Box has never expressed any opinion in Russia, in a wish not to compromise public opinion on him. Emily, what is what is your take on this? Well, in continuity, they have opposing views on EU-NATO relations. Marine Le Pen has in the past repeated her intention to get out of NATO, or at least from the commandement intégré. The peace will never want to distance itself from it. It wishes to stay under NATO's protection against the Russian threat. And Spain as well would like to rely on NATO, however, for different purposes. That of dealing with immigrants coming, for instance, from Morocco. Thank you, Dominic. You you wanted to elaborate on other uh, other countries regarding this issue. Yeah. Also, uh, like even though the 16 far right parties' ideas on immigration clearly converge, uh, decisions regarding asylum and migration policies have already brought about heated debates. While Fidesz and Peace, the Lone Justice Party in Poland, refuse to compromise on resettlement quotas. Right-wing populist parties in, in Italy, Greece and Spain uh, want the other EU states to welcome refugees coming through their coasts. The free movement of workers from Eastern European EU countries has also been challenged, mainly by right-wing populists in, in France and Italy, among others. Uh, Marine Le Pen has often expressed her wish to suppress the system of posted workers. Speaking about Marine Le Pen, Emily, you wanted to maybe add something regarding these economic issues? Yes, on economic issues, Marine Le Pen and Salvini appear to be the most protectionist of all. Marine Le Pen calls for intelligent protectionism, for instance, which would imply custom duties adapted to countries and sectors. The FPE, however, has stated being committed to the principles of market economy and on economic efficiency in its program. And Vox, as well, is a supporter of economic liberalism and calls for a drastic reduction in public spending as well as in taxes. Thank you. Uh, looking at the declaration, or more precisely, uh, at the list of the parties uh, which signed the declaration, uh, I'm wondering why other similar parties uh, from other European countries uh, did not join the declaration. Well. The joint declaration is meant to gather all voices standing against the communitarian EU of today. However, it piqued curiosity as some parties sharing the positions of the 16 signatories were not invited to sign the document or refused to sign it. The most bewildering absence, though, is that of German nationalist and populist alternative for Germany, IFD. It is possible that it wasn't approach because it frankly and vocally promotes a straight Dexit, an exit of Germany from the EU. However, that goes against the wish of the 16 parties of the declaration. They want to fundamentally reform the EU, not to leave it. There is also could be an economic reason behind this. A Dexit presupposes that Germany will no longer fulfill its role as a net contributor to EU funds. Let's not forget that Hungary and Poland are particularly financially benefiting from EU fund. Losing Germany would force the two countries to undergo dangerous economic changes. Dominic, uh, has been there any other discussion regarding other parties from other uh, European countries? A more troubling case is that of the Dutch sovereignist party Ja21. Indeed, the name of the party appears in the list of signatories, but it has quickly denied having signed the, the document. In the Dutch newspaper, Ja21 later acknowledged that discussions were initiated, but that it had refused to sign because Orban and its party have been exceptionally criticized in Europe for some time now. Ja21 explained, still in the newspaper, that it didn't wish to get closer to nor or to be associated with Orban, especially after the recent anti-LGBTQ law passed in Hungary. Finally, the Slovenian National Party, which is currently ruling, didn't sign a declaration. However, its likeliness and enthusiasm for Orban's party make it hard to believe that it will stay any longer away from Orban and in the EPP, the European Parliament group that Orban left earlier in 2021. What's more, Slovenian Prime Minister Janis Janša has in early July claimed to reporters that all kind of opinions on the future of Europe should be heard if Europe wanted to remain powerful. 
this will to free and make valid all European voices was also put forward in the introductory address given in the July 2021 Slovenian Presidency of the Council of the European Union. That included deliberately Orban's demands and thus legitimated the declaration. Thank you very much to all of you. Now maybe I would like to shift a little bit more to the perception of the of the publishing of the declaration and uh, using the advantage of having uh, guests with different backgrounds. I would like to ask, did the publishing of the declaration resonate in the countries when it comes to other maybe political parties or media? Sure. So when it comes to Italy, the first and the most important reaction was uh, that of Enrico Letta, a member and the head of the Partito Democratico PD, the main left-wing party in Italy. Letta commented his de uh, this declaration by saying that one cannot support the EU and Orban at the same time. Lega's representative in the EU, Marco Zanni, answered to this criticism by saying that it is not contradictory at all, since the aim of the Union is cooperation between states, it is just that its institutions should be more aware of the national sovereignty of each state member. Then he concluded by appreciating the version of the, of the Union that the, the current Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi is promoting. In Italy, many newspapers wrote about the declaration and the role of the two Italian parties in it. Often it was criticized. And apart from it, the possible uh, coalition itself is seen by Italian journalists as quite impossible, due to the ideological distance between the parties, even the two Italian ones. Fratelli d'Italia have already declared that they have no intention to leave their current coalition at the Euro Parliament, which is the ECR. It is important to add that the right-wing coalition has gained important results in Italy. In fact, it is expected to gain almost 50% of the votes, staying at the last service. At the meantime, Lega holds the biggest piece of it, with 22%. When it, uh, when it comes to Spain, though, uh, Spanish newspapers just report uh, the, what happened and the message of the declaration without commenting the choice of Vox itself, nor Pedro Sanchez commented it. Currently, Vox has earned many supporters and at the last elections it became the third most powerful party at the Congress with 52 seats, immediately after PCOE and PP. The majority of its supporters are young, low-middle class males with no university education, disappointed by the democratic politics and that sympathize the right-wing ideology. Emily, what has been the general reaction in France after Marine Le Pen announced that she signed the declaration? Well, French media generally observed that the declaration was only a political operation and that it would not lead to any concrete nor substantial steps. And that would be mainly because of the overwhelming disagreements between the 16 parties and their inability to compromise. Likewise, no changes in the organization of the far right in the European Parliament is foreshadowed yet. And finally, Marine Le Pen has had to deal with quite a setback following the regional election of this year and her party is currently in a critical financial situation. Therefore, it is expected that the alliance will fail. Dominic, recording this podcast episode in Austria, what about the perception of signing the declaration by the FPE? Well, the news is definitely relevant for every European, including Austrians. However, the Freiheitliche Partei Österreichs, the FPÖ, which has also signed the declaration, has only three seats in the European Parliament. One article I found uh, put Orban in the center of this declaration, saying that it was his initiative to build a united right-wing fraction in the European Parliament. Another article I read in, uh, in an Austrian news outlet talks about the cooperation of right-wing parties to be more of a marriage of convenience rather than a love marriage, highlighting the diverging party positions within uh, this new group of signatory parties. However, the very big media presence actually failed to appear. It did not make it into the news of the Austrian National Public Service, which reaches a significant number of Austrians. Thank you, but in case of Poland, we are speaking about a ruling party with a strong support who signed the declaration. Could you shed more light on the situation there, Dominic? Yes, in Poland there is a very different situation. 
uh, where the declaration got a higher media attention by media on both sides of the political spectrum. Gaczynski publicly announced the signing of the declaration in the state media with a six-minute explanation. The Law and Justice Party of Kaczynski is the second biggest uh, party in the, in the group of signatory parties, if it comes to seats in the European Parliament, of course. Most Polish media highlight the statement from the declaration that signatories parties do not want, I quote, a cultural revolution proposed by the European Union, quote end. Other media claimed that the declaration is not a great achievement, since the main goal was to unite all conservatives in the European Parliament, but not all of the parties signed, which are in the, in the two political groups in the EP. Some media outlets also highlight the fact that the Law and Justice Party, which has very cold relations with Russia, joins forces with Salvini, who in the past has been making pictures on the Red Square in Moscow wearing a t-shirt depicting Vladimir Putin. So we described the declaration itself and also the parties who signed the document. And while getting to the final part of our discussion, how would you evaluate the declaration in the framework of the Conference on the Future of Europe? And what consequences can have the, this strengthening of the nationalist conservative forces within the EU? Well, first of all, the title of the declaration is not without reference to the Conference on the Future of Europe, the initiative of the European Parliament and the European Commission to promote democracy, build a more resilient Europe and involve citizens in the discussion on the future of Europe. In a sense, both initiatives are working toward the same general goal, that is to transform the European Union and reform the institutions. It is in this very timing that the 16 parties have published a joint declaration that goes against the institutional structure and functioning of the European Union. Dominic, what is your outlook uh, when it comes to the declaration and uh, discussion on the future, on the conference on the future of the European Union? Uh, well, the two conservative political groups are the European Conservatives and Reformists and Identity and Democracy. Together they have 132 out of 705 seats in the European Parliament, which is around 18%. However, one has to keep in mind that not all MEPs vote according to the line of political group. The fundamental question here is whether the joint declaration will have any effects on the percentage of individual MEPs voting in line with the whole group. As there is no legal basis at all for that joint declaration, it is questionable whether it has any effect on the cohesiveness of voting behavior. One example, the cohesion policy of the EU. Conservative Polish MEPs will not vote against receiving financial support, whereas conservative parties from net contributing countries like France will definitely vote against. So, Misha, do you think is, is it actually possible that these conservatives or nationalistic parties will, will form a certain alliance in, uh, in the future? I think it would be a mistake to completely negate the possibility of them joining forces. Both political groups seem to have broadly similar idea about the future of the European Union. Both groups are not happy with the current state of supranationalism and centralization in the EU and the parties within both groups seem to not to move uh, towards the left so much. However, I believe that between and even within those two groups there will always be differences. Some MEPs and their national parties are soft Eurosceptics, while some others are hardliners and could be seen as hard Eurosceptics. Thank you. Yeah, it definitely remains to see what consequences, if any, the Conference on the Future of the European Union will have on shaping our common future within the EU and beyond, and actually what role these conservative and nationalistic forces will play within this process. Many thanks to all of you for your time and for the really in-depth analysis of the Joint Declaration and of the issues revolving around it. This was another episode of the IDM Expertise podcast. If you like our activities and would like to support the IDM, please follow us on our social media channels and become an IDM member. My name is Dana Martinek and I'm looking forward to reach to you soon. All the best and stay healthy. IDM. 
Podcast. Institut für den Donauraum und Mitteleuropa. Institute for the Danube Region and Central Europe. European Perspectives. Regional Actions. Cooperation and Expertise since 1953.